just in case you missed it, I said in my Galaxy S21 Ultra review that this is not just the best Samsung phone, but the best Android phone you can buy. But in order to establish whether this is also simply the best smartphone, you have to compare it against the best iPhone, the 12 Pro Max. So in this video, we'll be comparing all of the specs and features between these two flagships to see who can take the crown as the best smartphone. Let's take a look. For this video, I'll be comparing the Phantom Titanium S21 Ultra against the Graphite 12 Pro Max, just to give the closest comparison as possible. So starting with the design, this can really be separated into two parts. You've got the aesthetics, and then there's the functional side of things. Which of these phones you think looks better is of course entirely subjective, but many of you already know how much I love the Ultra's matte black finish, which I wish Apple would bring back to the iPhone. Apple's Pacific Blue finish is a very strong contender though, and to be honest, I'm just pleased that both phones are using a matte texture for the back glass. I think the Ultra has the nicest design on the camera bump, and I like the way it blends into the frame, but it's also a lot bigger and thicker than on the iPhone. Both phones have a pretty boxy design, but I really like the iPhone's beautiful and glossy flat-sided frame. It's just a shame that the glossy texture gets spoiled by fingerprints so easily but you'll spend most of your time looking at the phone's screen, and this is the reason I think the S21 Ultra wins for design overall. The hole punch just looks much better than the iPhone's big notch, the slight curve on the glass gives it super thin bezels compared to the iPhone, and the display makes it seem like a much more modern phone. In terms of functionality, the Ultra starts off better with its universal USB-C port, as opposed to the iPhone's Lightning port, which Apple really should have updated to USB-C years ago. The iPhone does have better button placement though, not so much for having the volume keys opposite the power button, but because it splits them into two easier to press buttons, and especially because of the super handy mute switch, a feature I wish more Android phones would take on. You've also got ergonomics to consider, and these are clearly both very large phones. They weigh roughly the same, but the Ultra does feel like a bigger phone because of its thicker and taller design. The slight curve on the Ultra's display doesn't cause the accidental touch issues of previous Samsung phones but the iPhone's flat screen is still my preference, and is easier to use. The iPhone is a bit shorter and wider, which overall gives it easier reachability, though both of these are clearly two-handed devices. I just prefer the size and aspect ratio of the iPhone, and also the higher quality haptic feedback, which I think gives it slightly better ergonomics overall. There's also durability to consider, and the iPhone has an edge with its stainless steel frame, which is of course harder than the aluminium frame found on the S21 Ultra, and so less likely to scratch. I would add though that I think any scratches the phones do suffer would likely show up more on the flatter, more reflective iPhone frame. Both phones are also using much tougher glass than in previous years. Samsung is more open in its use of Gorilla Glass Victus, but then Apple seems to make bolder claims with Ceramic Shield, which it says is the toughest glass in a smartphone. To be honest, you'll find real-world tests showing both of these phones as the victor here, and as tough as the glass is, either phone could shatter when dropped. I think the iPhone's design, with the flat screen, lends itself to better drop protection, but most people will be mitigating any durability differences with a phone case anyway. Apple also takes the lead with water resistance, offering protection at four times the depth of the S21 Ultra. So all things considered, the iPhone does have an edge for durability. Looking at the displays, here the S21 Ultra outspecs the Pro Max by some margin. The size difference is really the one spec that's almost identical once you account for the rounded corners, but otherwise the Ultra's display is sharper, faster, and much brighter. It's not just brighter for HDR content, but under normal use too, and also reaches a lower minimum brightness for those who are interested in that. Samsung added S Pen support for the Ultra too, which I'm sure a small minority will enjoy whilst the iPhone still doesn't support a stylus. But the biggest difference for me is the Ultra's adaptive high refresh rate, something we had hoped would be coming to the iPhone this year, but for me, remains its biggest missing feature. iPhones have always had very smooth displays with fluid animations, but this still can't compete with the high refresh rate on the Galaxy, which doesn't just enable super smooth scrolling, but things like high refresh rate gaming as well. You can also watch true 1440p content on the Ultra, thanks to the higher resolution, and the larger screen to body ratio gives a better movie viewing experience. The speakers do sound a bit richer and bassier on the Pro Max, 
even if the ultras are slightly louder. Before we start, I just thought I'd answer a question I get asked quite often. What about Jabra's Elite Active 75T? This extra model does make their earbuds line up more confusing. But simply put, the active version comes in a few different colours and has a higher water resistance rating than the non-active version. And that's it, so you can essentially consider all of the differences between the 85 and 70. In the iPhone's defence, it does have an edge for colour reproduction, which those who edit on their device may prefer. I still think its True Tone feature is second to none, and despite Samsung adding Eye Comfort Shield, True Tone allows the iPhone to give the most natural and consistent viewing experience. You've also got better haptics on the iPhone compared to the Galaxy, and as I said before, the flat display is a bit easier to use than the Ultra's slight curve. So we shouldn't forget that the Pro Max still has an excellent flagship quality display, but really these are just minor benefits compared to the huge display advancements the S21 Ultra has, so there's a very clear winner here. Very simply though, the display appearance remains the most noticeable difference between these phones, which as I said before is because of the Ultra's hole punch versus the iPhone's notch. And this leads me onto the familiar battle of Samsung's ultrasonic fingerprint scanner versus the iPhone's Face ID. I think I've reached the point now where the convenience of Face ID is being outweighed by the benefits the under-display fingerprint scanner brings, and especially now that the S21 Ultra has Qualcomm's second-gen sensor. Yes, Face ID works every single time, whereas the fingerprint sensor works 95% of the time, but that small compromise now seems worth it to get the better looking display compared to the notch. I am spending most of my time using these phones at home, where Face ID is more convenient, but then there are times I'm wearing a face mask out in public, and the iPhone becomes a real pain to use. I understand the technological limitations that mean we perhaps can't shrink the notch right now or place the sensors under the display, but the iPhone has had this notch designed for four generations in a row now. I'm definitely ready for something new, and with how reliable the Ultra's new fingerprint sensor has been, I think this has become my preference overall. But let's move on to the comparison most of you are here for, which is the cameras. The Ultra has the more eye-catching specs with its 108 megapixel main lens and the new dual telephoto cameras with 100x space zoom, but the Pro Max has some pretty advanced tech with the new sensor shift stabilisation and its lidar sensor. The iPhone's photos were typically brighter, and I noted in the Ultra review how Samsung seems to be muting the highlights, limiting the dynamic range. The Ultra still shows a higher contrast by lowering the black levels, and there's much more sharpening with Samsung's processing, as you can see here in the ground for example. The iPhone gives the most natural and colour accurate photos, and Samsung still has this magenta hue with a lot of the Ultra's photos, so whites especially have an unnatural pinkish tinge. The Ultra is prone to oversaturating colours to give more striking and vibrant images, which look good, but obviously comes at the cost of realism, but you can also see here that the iPhone has captured a lot more detail in the leaves. These colour and contrast differences are carried over to the ultra-wide lens, but the iPhone does seem to struggle with processing the colour of grass, often over-brightening it, so this is one subject where the ultra captures a more realistic image, although the detail in the clouds with the iPhone shot is pretty impressive. The S21 Ultra gave much sharper ultra-wide shots too, and didn't blur and distort at the edges as much as the Pro Max. Samsung's large main sensor brings a shallower depth of field, so you end up with less of your subject in focus, but it does give you this really nice natural blurred background. You can see the Ultra's higher contrast and saturation here too, and also the extra sharpening, which is easier to see if you crop in a bit closer. And this is before you switch on the high-res 108 megapixel mode as well, but I've discussed before that, in reality, this isn't a big advantage over lower megapixel lenses like on the iPhone, because you do have to crop in a lot closer to see the benefit. The Pro Max has captured the more realistic version of the real-life scene, but I do really like Samsung's image processing here, which gives the more pleasing and Instagram-ready photo. The iPhone still leads the field when it comes to HDR, and whilst most situations aren't as extreme as this, I think this shot highlights the main differences pretty well. If you ignore the lens flare at the centre, you can see how the Pro Max was able to bring down the overexposed sun and capture more detail in the sky, but it also retains the true darkness in the shadows of the bushes. The Ultra tries to flatten out the image by over-brightening the shadows, so it doesn't process dynamic range as well. The iPhone tends to perform better in tricky lighting conditions too, and here in this cloudy and rainy day shot, you can see how the colours are much more washed out with the Ultra's photo. The iPhone's deep fusion tech excels in situations like this, and you can see how it's captured a lot more detail here. 
These advantages carry over to the portrait mode as well, and though the portrait effect appears quite similar, you can see the benefit in detail and sharpness because the iPhone is using its telephoto lens, whereas the Ultra is cropping in on the main sensor, which results in quality loss. Samsung has done a better job with the white balance here though, and the Pro Max image is a little bit too warm compared to the real life scene. But I do think portraits in general look better on the iPhone, and again, that's largely because it's using the more suitable tele lens as opposed to cropping on the main, which the Ultra does. Night mode is fantastic on both of these phones, and they can each make dark scenes look like daytime. I generally found the Ultra had the better performance though, usually bringing out more detail with brighter photos and a higher sharpness. Sometimes this works against the phone and creates unwanted artifacts, so it isn't perfect but mostly works in its favour. The Ultra's white balance was usually better too, so colours were closer to real life, whereas the iPhone sometimes had a yellowish hue. You can see here how it raises the exposure more for the shadows, which can obviously reveal more detail, but again, this can often create unwanted noise as well, whereas the iPhone is more likely to capture the true realistic darkness of the scene. You may also have spotted that the Ultra's photo is a little bit out of focus, and the iPhone did typically focus a lot better and faster in dark conditions, so its LiDAR sensor is an advantage over the Ultra. Sometimes the Ultra just wasn't able to focus at all in situations where the Pro Max could, and this was even more pronounced when switching to the other lenses. LiDAR is a little bit more useful than Samsung's laser autofocus, giving better low light focusing and depth perception, but also gives more advanced AR features. Samsung's laser autofocus was mainly brought in to fix the focusing issues last year's S20 Ultra had, which it does do quite successfully, but it's not as sophisticated as the iPhone's LiDAR. The Ultra really pulls ahead with the selfie camera, which outspecs the iPhone with its 40 megapixel sensor, although its default mode actually produces lower res images than the Pro Max. However, looking at the results, the Ultra's selfies are pretty much better in every single way. They're much sharper, have more accurate colours and a realistic white balance, and interestingly, have better HDR as well. The iPhone has a warmer tone, as it tends to with portraits, which are normally good for selfies since there's flatter skin tones but it's not as true to life as we see here with the Ultra. The Ultra also has the high-res 40 megapixel mode, but I've talked before in previous videos how this mode is slower and doesn't give noticeable benefits unless you crop in really close. Plus, some aspects are worse than the standard mode, like dynamic range, so this feature isn't a huge advantage over the iPhone. The Pro Max redeems itself a little with the portrait mode, and typically showed greater depth perception to create a better portrait effect, which the Ultra sometimes struggles with but the Ultra still benefits from the same colour, sharpness and dynamic range improvements we saw with photo mode, so it has much better selfie performance overall. When it comes to zoom, the Ultra also has a clear lead, and its new dual telephoto system gives it a much greater optical zoom range than the Pro Max. The iPhone can only zoom optically at 2.5x, so it competes with the Ultra here, but then degrades in quality beyond this up to its maximum zoom of 12x. The Ultra can zoom optically at 10x, so everything up to this point is much higher quality than on the Pro Max, and it even takes some pretty nice looking shots at around 30x. The difference in quality between optical and digital zoom is really apparent at this 10x point, and though the iPhone is struggling and nearly maxed out here, the Ultra handles this just fine, with photos that are much sharper, have better colours, and simply much higher quality. We know its space zoom actually goes up to a crazy 100x, but most shots over 30x lose their quality too much to really be useful. Still, you'd have to crop on the iPhone's photos to match this kind of range, and it simply can't compete with the Ultra's far superior zoom capability. It beats the iPhone at the other end of the zoom range too with macro mode, automatically switching over to the Ultra wide lens for super close-up photography. This allows you to get macro shots that are just not possible on the iPhone, even if you manually switch to the Ultra wide lens so the Ultra certainly has the more versatile of the two camera systems. The S21 Ultra is the undisputed king of zoom, but the iPhone is the clear reigning champion of video, and there's still no other phone that can compete with the stability and quality. The Pro Max has better autofocus, especially when tracking moving subjects, and the image was sharper and less noisy than on the S21 Ultra. Video on the Ultra is good, some of the best on Android, in fact. It's just not on the same level as the Pro Max. The same was also true for the selfie video, 
and I mentioned in the Ultra review how Samsung's selfie video processing this year results in washed out colours and a lack of sharpness that was actually worse than in previous years. The iPhone's video is brighter, smoother, much more detailed, and has richer colours, so it's the clear winner when it comes to video quality. It's also the only camera able to shoot in Dolby Vision HDR, which does look absolutely insane. You can watch this back on your device in true HDR and see immediate results, but I would say that compatibility is fairly limited, and I don't think most people will end up using this. Samsung of course has 8K video, so it outspecs the iPhone in terms of resolution. We know already that the 8K quality isn't very good though, it's quite unstable, and we've discussed before how useless the feature ultimately is, since there aren't many 8K displays to watch it back on. I think the iPhone's Dolby Vision option is slightly more useful than 8K, but honestly, I wouldn't really use either. For me, these are the two best camera systems you'll find on a smartphone, and each one has different strengths. The Pro Max has objectively the better cameras, it captures images closer to the real life scene, shows greater high dynamic range, and has the best video performance. But the S21 Ultra's processing often results in better looking images, it has the superior selfie camera, plus it has a clear advantage when it comes to versatility thanks to its awesome zoom performance. Ultimately, this comes down to personal preference, so let me know in the comment section which phone you think has the better camera. Moving on now to performance, the Pro Max has Apple's A14 Bionic chip, whilst the Ultra has either the Snapdragon 888 or Exynos 2100. We know how this battle goes, the iPhone does have the more powerful processor, and outperforms the Ultra in terms of raw power. When you compare the benchmarks side by side, the Pro Max has a clear lead, and incidentally these particular scores are against the Exynos version of the Ultra. But I discussed in the Ultra review how the Snapdragon and Exynos models are very similar in performance this year. It's unlikely you'll actually notice any speed difference in day-to-day -day use, and both phones are more than capable of handling intensive tasks like video editing and high-performance gaming. Technically the iPhone sustained a higher frame rate during stress testing, but my real-world usage didn't show any noticeable difference. The phones are pretty evenly matched for connectivity, with both offering 5G and ultra-wideband support, but the Ultra has better future-proofing with the newer Bluetooth 5.2 and, more importantly, Wi-Fi 6E which has the potential to offer considerably faster download speeds. Since the Ultra got rid of expandable storage, the phones are now matched for storage options, with both starting at 128 gigs. The Ultra appears to completely outspec the iPhone with the RAM though, but we know that because of how well optimised the iPhone software is, that these are actually fairly evenly matched. However, the Ultra still does a better job of keeping multiple apps open in the background. The iPhone is more prone to having to refresh apps as you reopen them, a problem we've noticed is actually because of iOS as opposed to the RAM, but is still something worth noting. Again, because of the software, the Ultra is a better device for productivity, and its multitasking options are much more advanced than on the iPhone. iOS 14 did bring picture-in-picture -picture at last, but there's still no split-screen view like we have on the Ultra, and I think the S Pen support is just adding icing to the cake. iOS moved a lot closer to Android this year with the reintroduction of widgets, finally allowing users a little bit of customization for their home screens. But this is still nothing compared to what Android offers, and customization remains the biggest difference in these operating systems. This and multitasking are the two main reasons I enjoy using Android so much, but then I find the gesture control and navigation a lot smoother on iOS. I still think the iPhone offers a better ecosystem with other devices, and features like handoff and airdrop are still the best data sharing features, despite Android's best efforts. But then you look at the Ultra's Samsung DeX, which lets me view my entire phone wirelessly on my Apple Mac and easily drag and drop files, which I can't even do on my Apple iPhone. Look, the iOS versus Android battle is largely subjective, and isn't restricted to these particular phones either, so it's really for a separate video. I personally enjoy using both systems, but these two phones are close enough in all other aspects that the software will be the biggest influence on your overall experience. So which aspects you enjoy in each system will be down to your preference. The final performance point I want to touch on is the battery, and when you look at the battery specs, just as you could with the RAM, you might assume that the Ultra has the much better performance. But again, because of how well the software is optimised for the hardware on the iPhone, the difference is actually much closer. Real world testing gave me extremely similar performance, with both phones easily reaching a fantastic 10 plus hours of screen on time under normal use. 
I was ending the day having used the phones identically, with the batteries within a couple of percent of each other, and it surprised me just how evenly matched these were. I'd say the Ultra perhaps has a slight lead over the iPhone, especially since these tests were run with the settings at maximum, so you could drop down the screen resolution, for example, and extend the battery life even further. I really like that the Ultra's adaptive refresh rate means I can enjoy 120Hz without a heavy battery compromise, and I'm sure most people will be happy with the battery on either phone. When I was stress testing the phones for performance, I did notice that the Pro Max came out on top, ending with around 20% battery remaining as the Ultra died, so that's something to perhaps consider if you're heavily into gaming and plan on using the phone for sustained intense workloads. As for charging the phones, they each have different strengths, and the Ultra's is that it charges much faster. They both reach around 50% after half an hour with a fast charge, but the total charging time is much lower with the Ultra. It also charges by USB-C, a universal port, which I wish the iPhone used as well, but remember, neither of these phones comes with a charger in the box. The Pro Max's strength is MagSafe, which makes wireless charging much more convenient. The magnet system ensures the phone is aligned correctly on the charger, and opens up many more possibilities with magnetic charging docks, phone cases, and other accessories. The Ultra has reverse wireless charging, which the iPhone still doesn't, but as much as I like knowing this feature is available, ever since I first talked about it two years ago, I'm still yet to actually need it in real life. The iPhone's MagSafe, on the other hand, is something I use every day. So for charging, the Ultra wins for speed, but the iPhone wins for convenience. As you'd expect, these two flagship phones come with flagship prices, although in most regions, these are actually a fair bit cheaper than their previous gen models. It's interesting to see that the iPhone is the cheaper of the two phones this year, so this may be an important factor if you're deciding between them. If you're going for one of the higher storage options though, the Ultra is significantly cheaper to upgrade, so that's something to consider too. I personally don't think there's an obvious winner in terms of value for money, and though the Pro Max is cheaper, I think the Ultra is the more modern and arguably better phone, especially because of its display. Realistically though, it's your preference of either iOS or Android that'll be the main driving force in the purchase decision, and ultimately, it's the factors you personally prioritise that'll make one of these phones better than the other, be it the cameras, the displays, the build quality, or the performance. As expensive as these are, you're looking at two incredible smartphones, the very best iPhone and Android phones available right now. And if I had to pick a winner, I think Samsung's S21 Ultra has an edge and is the phone to beat in 2021. But which phone do you think won this battle? Are you team iOS or team Android? Let me know in the comment section which phone you're buying or if you think there's a better smartphone on the market right now. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.